We have two panelists here this morning. Uh, Yinka Makinde, Director of Digital Workforce and Professionalization at NHSX, and Georgina Ayola, CEO and Technical Director of Wavelength Solutions and Wave Palm Tech Solutions. Uh, to save us from reading the whole of the profile, you have fantastic profile. My colleague will just quickly post them on the chat forum uh, so that you can follow us. But just to say that, I just want to tease out a few areas from their profile before I ask them to share a few words of open remark. So Yinka Makinde uh, started a, a career as a pharmacist and then moving on to consultancy and then from consultancy now into health uh, tech, uh, health, uh, health science at the NHS. So 25, 27 years career she has built herself uh, both in NHS, but also has experience of commercialization on vital footprint. So she will tell us more about that. And then Georgina Ayola, uh, is, she's a mother, she's an engineer, and she has two companies uh, coming from mechanical engineering into computer engineering. I mean, our profile is just fantastic. So we want to find out more from both of them. Ayola has a business in the UK and also in Africa, Nigeria, and Kenya. So we'll be, it will be interesting to find out from both of them, their entrepreneurial experiences over the past few years. But I want to start now by asking uh, Yinka to just share in five minutes your aspiration and entrepreneurial journey. And now, then and now, uh, what can you share with us in terms of your women science innovator? Over to you, Yinka. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Akinsh uh, sorry, Adishola and um, Lindsay. Thank you very much for the opportunity to join the panel today. Um, so I would like to start by sharing what I believe to be a couple of the traits and characteristics that are precursors to becoming an entrepreneur. Um, and those include sort of curiosity, a restlessness or a feeling of not being content with the status quo, um, enough to drive one to distraction, and as well as having a, a certain appetite for risk taking. And I think those three things were the things that sort of propelled me to want to become an entrepreneur, really. Um, so, I mean, I started my career in pharmacy, um, came from a very traditional Nigerian family where so the career trajectory was was to work in a profession and, and one that would sort of almost guarantee you a job for life. Um, pharmacy definitely is a very respected and stable profession, but, but I think right from the get-go, my imagination and, and vision was, uh, sort of was, was racing. And, and I, really wanted to, um, I really wanted to make an impact to a large number of people at scale. And I think at that time, I realized that pharmacy was unlikely to be the vehicle through which I could do that. So, so my entrepreneurial sort of ambition started very, very early on in my career. And I sort of dabbled in a number of things early on. Um, uh, whilst I was still being a pharmacist, I sort of dabbled in sort of um, property investment. And at, at one stage, I was looking to invest in a in an online DVD rental. Now these were not necessarily serious at the time, but I think I was developing that, that hunger for entrepreneurship very early on. And so I think um, uh, at the same time, I used my, my pharmacy uh, experience to broaden my skill set. So I moved into consultancy um, and other roles to broaden my skill set, but also to broaden my network. Um, so that I could start to learn from other sectors, um, learn from other people, and learn from a diverse set of people um, to put me in a much better position to then launch out on my own. So then it was in 2003, I think, that the opportunity, sorry, not 2003, 2013, where uh, the opportunity came for me to, to really launch out properly and, and take that risk. Um, that I referred to at the start and um, and I set about starting first of all I set up a pharmacy first of all I started a, a consultancy business um, 
which was sort of relatively safe because it was it was leveraging my pharmacy expertise. Um, but for the first time, I had to build my own team and I ha had to uh, build that team to be confident enough to go out and start to sell, sell my services to customers and generate revenue. Um, and I did that, but using my expertise that I already had. Um, it was a really interesting learning experience. I definitely generated revenue. Um, I um, had the experience of, of dealing with some of the more challenging HR issues and, um, and also developing my skills in selling, which is obviously one of the key, key areas that you need if you're going to be an entrepreneur. Um, but that also then started to help me sort of raise some of the capital that I then needed to, um, to launch my actual business that I really had the passion to develop. And that was a tech startup. Um, and so sort of a couple of years later, I launched uh, and started to develop a tech startup, which was also leveraging some of the technology skills that I'd been developing since 2004. Um, and that was a business that was, uh, which I felt had the ambition to reach thousands of people, which was one of the things that I really wanted to do, as I mentioned. Um, it was using my tech skills that I developed over the last few years, plus my healthcare knowledge. And the tech startup was in a nutshell, sort of aiming to address some of the challenges around healthy eating um, and obesity, and it was it, it aimed to try and navigate people to better food choices. Now, I learned the most during that experience, um, but it was also the experience where I had the biggest failures. And um, uh, having invested a sig significant amount of money, building a team, going out, doing huge amount of business development, developing an, a, an actual product um, those were some of my most exciting years in my career to date, I have to say. But they were also some of the most painful years because um, I, as I said, I failed. Um, but also it was where I started to experience some of the issues that I think we're going to be talking about in this session around um, uh, sort of discrimination um, uh, against sort of women and women of colour uh, who are trying to be entrepreneurs. I think I will pause there. Um, and I really look forward to talking about teasing out some more of those issues of, as we uh, go through the session today. Thank you very much, Yinka, uh, for that introduction. And you mentioned quite a lot of issues that, that we'll be looking at later on. So let me ask the same question uh, to uh, Georgina Ayola who is the technical director of Wavelength Solutions and Wavepalm Tech Solutions. Welcome, Georgina, over to you. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, um, Dr. Shala, for having me on um, as a panelist on this discussion. It's something that is very dear to me. Um, as um, you introduced to me, um, I am an engineer and um, I did um, electronics. Um, in fact, I, I started off with electrical electronics and then went back again and did electronics because I loved electronics so much. And um, I think um, having to do such a course actually really just says a lot about me, um, to be honest. I'm very, very logical. I, I like to do things that nobody has ever done before. So which makes me very innovative. I'm always, I'm very curious. I'm always um, looking for how to, um, perfect thing sometimes could be like one of my weaknesses actually um and sometimes it get, put, puts me into trouble because um I start off with a project and um you know I'm like oh wow you know I get stuck in the middle and then until I get to the end of it before I'm actually happy um so like with um you know I started off with um um, my career as an um, electronics engineer and I remember being in university and um, applying for you know like the milk rounds and 
I, I knew that I was quite special then on because every milk round that I um, actually applied to, I got the job. And I was quite fortunate to be picked by like the likes of Sony Electronics, Shell Technology, um, and they gave me the platform. And obviously, you know, as an engineer, you want to shine. And um, you, <laughs> you basically, we, we like to show off. And I kind of like picked up some of the awards that were given during the time. Um, one of the biggest um, platforms I've worked on that is, you know, very rewarding for me was working at the Great Common Street while I was in the hospital and while I was in the university. And it was one of the milk rounds and they got uh, like students and like almost about 50 students had to apply for it and they only took three of us so that was you know I felt that oh wow there must be something that I'm you know that they see that they've seen in me even though I was terrified in the you know when I started my my course being the only woman um you know in my my own area field but then in the whole engineering, like for the electrical electronics, we we're only three and we were up to about 170 um, students. So obviously it was terrifying knowing that, you know, you had to compete um, with, you almost have to be, you know, twice as good as um, the guys on the course because they relatively feel that, even the lecturers felt that, you know, the course is not meant for women is I've we had like you know some lecturers that would tell you ask you but why did you choose this course what was why 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 are you here why don't you just do something else like maybe structural engineering or something like you know like that so you know in you know from the onset that I, I'm I'm always one that I, I love challenges anyway so I knew from the onset that it's not going to be a, a um a smooth ride and when I finished, um, before I got my, um, my results came out, I got snapped up by Sony Electronics. And um, I, I went there, obviously, you know, as an engineer, we do like to show off. And I remember going to my interview and I took a suitcase. I took a, a hold on like I was traveling. And I, I, you know, and I got there and I had all the, um, the chats and everything. I was so well prepared. And when they asked me a question that was part of what I was actually working on for my dissertation, I was just like, I gave the guy, you know, in fact, I derived the formula for him on the picture. And it was like, they told me there and there that I got the job. And, um, you know, I went in there at Sony Electronics. I realized I was the only woman as well. And, um, you know, there's so many challenges for knowing that you are training some other people that come after you, but yet they get paid more than you. Um, so there were so many challenges in there, but, you know, not to want to, um, to give up. You know, I knew then that I needed to do something. I needed to, um, you know, I needed to have my own company. I needed to um, give back. I needed to en empower of, of other people to be able to strive. People in my situation or people that just don't feel that they're good enough to be able to do anything. For women, girls, um, being able to get into engineering, I knew that I had to do that. And so, you know, when I had my my when I had my daughter, um, I think that that was a light bulb that came on that you know what I can actually um, you know work by my uh, you know work um, as an entrepreneur and I started doing a lot of other things within the engineering field. I opened up. Um, uh, a company in Kenya to start up with. I was going to do it in Nigeria, but there was a lot of like roadblocks and, and all of that. And I felt that Kenya was easier for me because all people that I'd met during the, you know, like being a channel partner for a particular company, um, we kind of like came together and we formed a company. And then from there, I, you know, opened a wave pump technology in, in Kenya which has now become that operations department in Kenya. And then I went on to open um, uh, Nigeria. It was now easier for me now to go to Nigeria and open a Nigerian company there because I could use um, Kenya as a reference point. And so we've had the company in Nigeria running now from 2015 and we're still going. Um, during the time we have built set up boxes from scratch 
with um, built uh, mobile phones, um, wave palm tech, um, wave palm tablets. Actually, the wave palm tablets came about. The wave palm name came about from the word um, your hands hand um, hand tablets. So wave palm your palm tablet. So you came that that's how the way that the name actually um, came about. And so we, we we devised our own tablet pieces, which we actually um, is actually the tablet tablet pieces were actually made for African um, kids for a start. So we started, we did that, we developed them, designed and developed our own wave palm tablets, um, deployed that into Africa. And then um, in the past um, five years, we have really been very strong on software development. Um, sorry, actually, um, the past seven years, we've been very active, actively in software development. I remember when I first talked about applications in um, 2012, people were looking at me, they could not understand. And th these are the challenges that I have, because I'm normally like five years ahead of my time, really. So I, I, I you know, I, I it just, I'm just a bucket of ideas. So many ideas, sometimes I have to calm myself down. And, um, you know, so I come up with these ideas and, and I just go and people say, but who gives you the, 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 the authority to be able to, to do this? And I said, because I can, you know, I'm not, I don't need to, I don't need anybody to validate my idea. I can, I fund it and I go ahead and I do it. And then after I've done it, people are like, okay, maybe about three years later or four years later, people are like, actually, what you talked about then five years ago, that's what we're using. I said, but when I was telling you, nobody understood. And that's the one of the challenges that innovators have and entrepreneurs have. We, we think so much ahead and then, you know, we're frustrated by it because people do not understand at the time. By the time they understand it, it's already flooded the market and it's not innovative anymore. So yeah, so my career has kind of like really spanned that way. Um, we are very strong in Nigeria and um, our company here in um, UK um, is the main company and it has like the sister company. So it kind of like funds the sister companies in Africa. And um, at the minute we have in Africa, we have like something called the, um, the Wave Pump Academy, which we um, give, um, um, university students, um, engineering students, um, the chance to come into our company and we actually mentor them. We um, give them the platform to be able to, to thrive. And um, most of them have been snapped up by um, major companies. One of our very um, um, students that did work with us uh, was snapped up by Visa. And um, so we have like, you know, the, and, you know, they send us like testaments saying, you know, that, you know, we gave them that platform that they could not have been able to do what they're doing if they had not actually gone through our company. So we have a lot of, um, and this, we have a lot of applications that we are launching where also uh, applications means that we are also in, um, you know, we, we, we cover various areas, like we cover the um, uh, medical leisure, um, uh, um, education, FinTech. So um, in the moment we have like um, application, um, a wave telemedicine application that we are actually launching soon. Um, so a lot of in-house applications that we have that is ongoing. So um, in a nutshell, I think I would um, pause as well. And, um, you know, allow um, Dr. Shola to take over. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I do, I do apologize if I'm going so much. <laughs> no, it's very interesting. Your introduction from yourself and Yinka, very, very interesting. And so we're going to go into uh, open questions. And I want to come back to Yinka, you know, just to tell us more about your role at NHS, what is NHS X? Can you just tell us more about your role, what you are doing? Sure, um, so I joined NHS X um, at the start of the pandemic last year actually, and um, having worked in digital health for the last 17 years, um, NHS X was basically the brainchild of Matt Hancock um, before he left as um, health secretary and it was set up 
set up in 2019 to supercharge digital transformation across the NHS. Because even though the NHS had spent about 20 years trying to innovate using digital, it was still very slow and very still very much behind other sectors. So Matt Hancock, when he came in as health secretary, um, conceived this new unit. And basically the unit is uh, brings together the expertise of NHS England, which is what the commissioning body for the NHS, plus uh, Department for Health and Social Care. So it brings together all of that expertise. So it has strategy, policy and delivery. Um, so it's been going since 2019 with a pure focus on technology and digital. So when I started um, last year, I was head of innovation, uh, which meant that uh, I was sort of leading some of the innovative projects, uh, a lot a lot to do with remote monitoring, using innovative apps so that patients could be cared for uh, virtually uh, and remotely. And obviously at the start of the pandemic, that really came into its own because patients could no longer go into hospitals or GP practices. And this technology suddenly, you know, it's technology that we've been trying to roll out for the last five years, suddenly became the most important thing that we could do for the healthcare service. So, so actually for the last 18 months or so, remote monitoring and other virtual means have been really important for the NHS. So, um, so now I've actually switched my role uh, to become director of digital workforce. And my focus is now less about the, the actual technology. It's more to do with the workforce, uh, the 1.3 million people that work across the NHS um, and developing that workforce so that they're more able and ready to embrace digital technology and the value that digital transformation can deliver for the healthcare service. And so a lot of that is around um, workforce planning, it's around attracting these skills from other sectors because we just don't have enough architects and engineers and user researchers and all those specialist skills that we need, making the NHS an exciting place for them to work and keeping them in the sector so that we can actually drive and realize the benefits of digital transformation. Uh, so it's a fairly new role for me. I've been in it since October and still getting my feet under the table, but we've got a significant challenge ahead of us and but a very exciting one. So, so that's currently what I'm doing. I'm working with lots of other sort of stakeholders outside of NHSX to make this happen. Okay, that's, that's very useful to learn more about your, your role. So I want to ask, uh, both of you mentioned uh, challenges that you are facing in your respective uh, organizations or in your profession generally. So I want to start with, uh, let me go back to Gina just to ask some specific challenges as a woman, you know, black woman innovator uh, and being very different in your own electronics engineering, computer technology. How are you able to weather the storm in the, you know in the last few years what, what what did you do you know to overcome those challenges um thank you very much for the question um i think it's um very very vital um i would say for me it's a passion that i have for what i do and i think um when i do um talk about what i do I, i'm it's just such a very passionate you know, I talk about it passionately, really. Um, I actually love what I do. I feel very privileged that um, I've always worked in my field of choice. And what I studied is what I'm doing. Um, and I've grown from it. Um, I think that you're, you're, the, if, you, if you're not passionate about what you do, I think um, it, it's very, very easy to give up because there's so many challenges anyway. But when you are passionate about what you do, no matter what, you will you will try to actually weather the storm. And for me, I would say the number one thing is the passion. It's not been easy. It's been very difficult. A lot of the projects that I've done for so long, I have funded my the projects. Um, now, like with the wave telemedicine, 
like for example, what Link has said, um, you know, like during the um, pandemic, I was just really terrified that, you know, with the way things were. And for me, um, I, I'm, I wish that we do not have any problems, but I look for problems because um, I want to, I'm, a, I'm very solution driven. Um, so I'm a problem solver and I, and I use my skills to be able to um, ensure that that is actually, um, you know, being given. And so with the pandemic, I just saw like an opportunity. I saw, um, you know, a way for me to be able to, um, you know, because I, I, I was, it was almost like I felt really, um, um, what's the word, almost like paralyzed. I felt you know, what can I do? What can I do? So I was looking at what can I use my skills to do? How can I be of use to the situation at hand? And so we started do, working on te telemedicine because I found out that people were finding it difficult to be able to get to even, even when they call, they're finding it difficult to be able to get on. There was a time that I wanted to, I, I tried to call and I could not get through. And I'm thinking that someone that is actually going through situation is they're going to find you know this is obviously the number one thing that we should be looking into and so that was how wave telemedicine came about and I started working on the wave telemedicine and I tried to get into NHS there were lots of like roadblocks and all of that I just thought in fact one time I wanted to walk into my MP and say I've got this platform use it you know I, you know, just use it as much as you can. You know, it's available. You can do um, video calls. You can connect to your GP. GP can, can connect to it. We had lots of webinars and everything. And then, you know, I just thought, okay, do you know what? Um, Africa, if we are able to get this into Africa, we are also helping ourselves here because that means that, you know, um, we are going to curtail a lot of issues that will transpire from it. So, you know, Wave Telemedicine is going to be launched in Nigeria for first, firstly, this um, before the end of um, February. And it's already onboarded like about 60 doctors on ground um, that will be working across board. So, um, like I said, um, it's a passion. The passion has just, it's just been my vehicle. It's been my, it, it, you know, it's been my, 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 my jet, really, my private jet that have been able to actually ride on it through thick and thin. Okay, that's, that's, very, that's very useful. Uh, I wonder if uh, any of you can actually shed a bit more light on the gender differences in your respective industry. So in the health, you know, digital health <laughs> and um, engineering you know, and technical background, because you said earlier, Gina, that when you were starting, people were asking you, are you sure you are, why are you doing this? Why have you not considered other vocation or other profession? How yeah. you can mention cultural issues coming from an African-based background? How, again, how did you, the storm, how did you convince people that this is definitely the way for you? Okay, so for me, and, and, and this is the honest truth, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a scenario. I walked into, um, there's a, a course called the Digital Elect Electronics uh, module, and you really have to pass that Digital Electronics module to really um, to, to get your degree, basically. That is a core module that you need to pass. And for me, and obviously you have like engineering maths. I was very, I'm very good at mathematics and physics. So it, it was like, it's always like a playground for me, like, you know, a playground. It might sound kind of like <laughs> funny, but you know, when I see that I'm, I'm excited. And um, so, I walked into the lecture room and um, it was like, I was very early. People were in the theater, lecture theater. And um, as I walked in, the lecturer looked at me and pointed and said, what are you doing here? And I thought he was talking to someone else. So I looked back and said, no, you, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I'm on this course, sir. And he said, no, I'm asking, why are you women here, you know? And so I don't know, I'm very respectful. So I just had to say, the reason why you're here, sir, 
and I just walked away to go and sit down. And then obviously I was quite young then. So I ran to, after the course, um, the lecture, I ran to my um, my tutor and I cried. And I said, you know, he said this. And he, my teacher was such an amazing guy. And he said, don't worry, my dear. He said, don't worry about him. He's like that with everyone and all of that. And so I determined when I got to the halls of residence, I determined and I said to myself, I'm going to be the best in this module for this guy. I'm going to work so hard that he will remember my name. And that was what I did. I worked so hard that in the practicals, I, I still, you never get like, how can you get 90 something in practicals? No, you don't get 90 something in practicals. I was the top in the practicals. I was the top, I got my top, top grades. So he remembered my name and he remembered how relevant I was in this. So he's like not giving up, understanding why you are there and going for it. And, you know, not many people have the conf confidence, but um, I think at a very early age, I was quite privileged with my dad felt that I could do just anything. I could be, my dad actually wanted me to be a doctor by the way. And he was so disappointed that I, you know, changed my course to being an engineer. And, but he believed in me and, you know, it's very important like from growth from, you know, at an early age, we believe in our child, children, no matter what comes to them, they will remember that and they know they have that confidence in them. And I think for me, that apart from me being very stubborn and going for what I want, I, I believe that that also really did um, make a very lasting impression. Okay, that's very useful. Nika, what about you? Challenges, Gina mentioned confidence. Do you, you mentioned earlier that uh, you know, there's some challenges that you encountered even in the course of your career over the years. Can you just shed more light on, you, know, you mentioned discrimination. And so I want us to just you know, spend a bit more time on this aspect of barriers that women innovators face and how you are able to overcome them in the course of your own career. Yeah, sure. So um, in my non-entrepreneurial career, um, I, do not necessarily think I've had any major experiences of discrimination. That's my belief. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that I've had some one or two good mentors along the way, or not even mentors. I think they've just been supporters somehow um, who have had my back and have helped me to get to the next level. So I think in my non-entrepreneurial career, I've been very blessed and very lucky to have got to where I am now, but it's largely because I've had really good supporters. In my entrepreneurial career, I think my greatest barrier was access to funding. Mm. And that's what killed my business, ultimately. Um, uh, and... And so I remember distinctly spending the whole of 2015 pitching to investors. I spent my whole life pitching to angel investors, banks occasionally, um, to try and get the funding that I needed to sustain the business. And I got small pots here and there, but I didn't get this quantum that I needed. Um, now, I think back then, so that was in 2015, I think... Um, women entrepreneurs in tech businesses were still there, were, there still weren't enough women in tech businesses then and certainly very few uh women of color um trying to develop tech businesses competing in a london market um where you know um what do they call it um the roundabout in old street you know where there was a real sort of bars of activity it was mainly um driven by you know young men startups uh that were uh some of them were coming over from uh america um and so i was basically competing in that market um now i thought it was brilliant i was so excited i thrived on the energy but in reality it was going to be very hard for me to raise the money that i needed um now i think we have two issues i have if we're talking about intersectionality intersectionality so two issues were against me, one black, one a woman. Now I think in if we're looking at female led 
startups. I think we've made significant progress, by the way, since 2015. There's so many more, and actually many of them are doing fantastically well. Um, but I think um, common, issue, common perceptions of wi women trying to lead startups, particularly sex, sex, uh, tech startups, is uh, we're almost always classed as too emotional and not rational. Um, we are easily distracted, uh, particularly if we have sort of other things going on in our, in our lives like childcare. Um, there might be an issue or perception that we are less risk taking um, or, and that we have a fear of failure um, and potentially less focused. None of which I agree with, by the way, but I think in a traditionally male dominated sort of um, area, um, particularly tech, which is traditionally male led, um, I think some of these perceptions still exist. But having said that, I think we've made significant progress over the last few years because I think there's been an increased focus on trying to get more women into this space. Now, if we talk about race or ethnicity, I still think we've got a long way to go. And I'm only talking about tech. Um, I think we still have insufficient people of color um, uh, leading tech startups. Um, and I know, and it's really important that we do. We have we have to have more women, and we have to have um, more eth uh, a greater diversity in terms of ethnicity. And I'll give you an example of why we need this. Um, obviously, artificial intelligence is is a huge um, uh, area that's evolving, and is becoming more and more. Um, prominent in its, in its importance for uh, many of the innovations that we will be benefiting from in the future and now. But the problem that we have with AI is that um, all of the algorithms that are being developed are largely being developed by very homogenous teams of people um, uh, that are uh, sort of white, uh, male, of a certain age group, and those are obviously causing biases in the algorithms that are coming out the other end. That is dangerous. So for the, and from a healthcare perspective, it's hugely dangerous if we have algorithms that are determining key decisions that need to be made for patients, but those algorithms are being designed based on the experiences and, pers and pers um, perspectives of a very homogenous group of um, engineers that are developing those algorithms. So we need diversity in the sector for a very real reason. Uh, but there is a lot of work that's going into trying to make the sector more diverse, uh, but we still need to do more. Well, you've just opened new opportunities for development, uh, as you mentioned, AI. And our university, we actually have a network, uh, a research network on artificial intelligence and ethics. Uh, and it will be interesting, actually, both of you, you know, to explore later as I'll be looking at other questions in terms of maybe collaboration. Uh, because both of you mentioned, and uh, Gina mentioned collaboration with universities, especially on uh, maybe internship and placement. So it, I want to follow up from what Yinka mentioned about challenges. Is there a sense of women feeling less credible then, you know, than the male innovators? Any of you can take that question. Do you feel there's a sense of uh, men not, you know, believing women innovators? You mentioned quite a few things, Yinka, about, you know, being irrational, emotional. You know, does that, you know, lead on to, you know, women feeling uh, this sense of lack of credibility when it comes to entrepreneurship and innovation. Um, sorry, I don't know if Gina, I feel like Gina wants to come in, but I, um, I'll just say that I think the real test of how credible uh, uh, someone feels they are is when they are standing in front of investors uh, when you're an entrepreneur. Because that's, that's the test. Like if you can convince 
a panel of investors who very much is still made up of um, uh, sort of white males. I mean, I know that's changing, but it's still a very common scenario. If you can convince that panel, then that's validation almost. And unfortunately, um, as an entrepreneur, you are always you are always going to need to go out and find funding from a third party unless you come from huge amounts of wealth but you are always at some stage in your entrepreneurial journey going to need to find investment from someone else and I think for me Gina will probably have may have a different perspective for me credibility came um, when I was faced with trying to raise funding and how they how they viewed me and actually, none of them were ever disrespectful. Um, they were all, everyone was always very pleasant. Everyone always had great things to say about my business concept. But they didn't want to put the money where their mouth was. So, so that was a test of how credible they found me at the time. Yes. Okay, interesting. Gina, do you have? Do you share the same experience? Um, no, I do not. Um, but I do understand. Um, Inca's um, side of view. Um, I, I, like I said, my, my background is um, speaks for itself. So when I go on, when I do projects, I do projects within my own, um, you know, my own expertise. And um, so, like for example, like applications that we have written, you know, I'm involved in actually writing the algorithms. I'm involved in um, the development of it. So I understand it fully. And most of the times um, we have, and if I may correct, I've really not, I've not gotten any funding yet. Um, recently, we've been approached by investors that want to invest in some of the applications that we have done, but have not taken anyone as of yet. Um, I always come with the notion of where I want to build it first at least do the MVP first and put it out um, not just having any um, documentation so I would and once you have like the MVP out or even like a live project and it's running it will speak for itself and it will by itself I understand that it's not everybody that will be in my position in the sense that they are able to fund the project. I don't come from a, a wealthy family. Um, my family is just okay. My parents are very aged. So, you know, um, you know, I'm probably looking after them the, the other way around, um, you know, but what I'm saying here is that I will, I, I tend to actually fund my projects by also putting my own work in. So I'm involved in actually the development of the project. So I don't need to spend uh, a, you know, a very big amount, a um, huge amount of money on my projects um, because I'm not paying myself, basically. I'm, I'm not paying myself. My other staffs are paid. Um, I take on some other consulting um, roles. I'm very well paid and that tends to actually fund what I do. Um, but yeah, so, I, when it comes to like discrimination amongst women, I think that already, that exists, that it, it was really bad when I first started, really, really bad when I started, um, but it's improved, it's improved now. I must say it has really, really improved. There's still a long way to go. I see some of the things that are happening even through my, 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 my daughter's eyes, um, you know, eyes, I see that those days, some of the things that I see, I'm like, I didn't realize that this is still there, but it really is, it's still there. We can't say no to it. I don't allow it, to, I don't make it an issue. And I think that's why I've been able to actually thrive in my career because it's never, an, it's not an issue for me. I don't, I don't pay attention. I think that's what I'll say. I really don't pay attention to it. Um, but not to say that it is something that should not be actually addressed because it is still there. It's very wrong and it should really should be addressed, but it's not as bad as it was like say 10, 15 years or 20 years ago. Okay, that's interesting. So I want to pick up on what Yinka mentioned earlier about risk and failure. And I want to ask both of you, how do you cope I mean, can you just give us an example of 
you know, failure, I mean, she mentioned, you know, failure uh, was the inability to actually to be able to continue with a startup. And uh, in your own case, Gina, what would you consider as a failure in as a startup, as an entrepreneur? Um, to be honest How with you, you um, with doctor, failure? Yeah, to be honest with you, doctor, I would say um, it depends on how you actually define failure. Because I, 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 I define failure as a stepping stone. Um, you know, how would you grow if you have not be knocked down you don't know how we should get to the next level so i consider it there is faith you 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 know I, I always say you can i can I, I can't go further than where when i'm being knocked down the i you know the only option for me is to either stay down or to 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 rise up and when i do rise i will rise higher than where i was before i was knocked down and for me that's just the way that maybe that's just me but that's the way I look at the, um, I'm always, I, I remember when I finished in, um, university and I was applying to, um, um, to uh, before I finished, you know, before I finished, um, got my results. And I was, because uh, I was, I was terrified because I saw how things were. And I was terrified that I will finish and I will not get a job because, you know, the men will get the jobs more, um, before I got my, before I, before, before I as a woman am considered. And that was basically what it was. Um, but what I did, I was so terrified that I would send for every rejection letter that I got, I, you know, programmed my mind for every rejection. I sent another five um, um, applications out. So um, it was just a matter of time to to get to to get um a job and you know the job that i got was even they didn't my results were they were they didn't bother about my results because my presentation you know i did so well at the interview that you know the manager that jet was the general manager of sony and he said i want you you know and um so i i for failure for me, it would, I, I would define failure differently um, in, sen in the sense that it's an opportunity to, to be, to, you know, to, 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 to go, go for the stars, basically. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Nika, do you have uh, something to share about how yeah. you were able to cope with failure? Yeah, so I agree to an, to an extent with Gina. Um, so I think failure for me is about growth um and i think failure should be embraced really i think culturally in this country in england um when it comes to entrepreneurship i think we have a we have a slightly more negative view towards um failure than other um other countries like america failure is celebrated actually and, and in fact Failure in America um, wins you your badges of honor um, and is valued when you are trying to raise money. Um, whereas here it's not viewed in the same way, but I actually think it should be um, because you don't learn unless you failed, really. So I think it's part of growth. I think it's really important. And I agree with Gina in that you just need to find a way of picking yourself up quite quickly. Um, but um, then channeling what you've learned back into the next thing that you then pick up and, and take forward, but hopefully doing it better than you did last time. Um, yeah. okay. So, so I think, yeah, I think failure is fine. Um, and, but also not to, not just, and also to let yourself go through the, the process, the grieving process as well, without feeling ashamed or embarrassed about it. I mean, I, Personally, I think that period that I had, I probably felt quite bad um, for a short amount of time. Um, I'm probably a little bit embarrassed, really, I think. Um, but I got over it quite quickly. Um, and then I was ready to take on the next sort of role. Um, and my next role happened to be in a safe organization uh, uh, but what was great about that role was that I had an entrepreneurial role within a safe organization. So I was still leveraging my entrepreneur 
uh, my natural entrepreneurship and I developed um, from scratch basically a digital health ecosystem across the whole of London, um, but for the NHS. And so I was still able to, to do the stuff that I loved, but without the fear of running out of money. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, so it was great. So there's always ways that you can redirect your energy. Um, but I think it's learn fast. Look, they, they, there's a saying, fail and what's it? fail fast and move on or something. I think you, if you can do that and pick yourself up, then, then, then that's a good thing. I mean, that's, that's very interesting and very uh, useful to understand from both of you. But Inyinka, uh, from what I know about you, um, does that mean that obviously you have a dream about the vital footprint? So mm -hmm. does that the failure has discouraged you from pressing forward you know, to achieve your object, I mean, your dream, really? No, it hasn't. I still, I still have that ember burning inside me and I really would love to be able to do something with that at some stage but the main lesson that I learned from my experience before was do not invest your entire life savings into a business you really do have to you really do have to find you do have to find a way of getting um, investment from elsewhere and so I wouldn't start a new business unless um, I knew that I'd be able to do that. I mean, there are, there are a couple of other lessons that I learned, like um, the importance of having a co-founder. I was very much doing it on my own. I had a team, um, but in terms of the leadership, personally speaking, and this may not apply to everyone, personally speaking, I would prefer to have a co-founder. Um, so I think I wouldn't do another business uh, unless I had a co-founder as well. But no, I certainly, it's still uh, still certainly a, a life ambition that I have because I love shaping things from nothing. I'm definitely a creator um, and I, I still want to be able to do that. Interesting. So I want to move a little bit further now to uh, and by the way, thank you for that engaging conversation. And I hope uh, the audience, you are putting your question, you are beginning to put questions on the chat. Please do that. There'll be time for you to ask the panelists the question. There is a fact uh, which says women make better entrepreneurs. Companies with female founders perform 63% better than those of their male peers. Do you agree with this fact? Gina. Um, Yes, I do actually. I do very much so. Um, and um, I think um, Ying has said, mentioned some something, or maybe it might have been you earlier regarding um, the challenges with, um, you know, working with women in the work in the you know the workforce, especially the technical work workforce, where um, you know, you know, with the the challenges with childcare and stuff like that. Um, I think um, women are able to multitask very, very well. Um, you can do like multiple things. I certainly do multiple things at the same time. I remember someone talking to me yesterday and said, do you ever sleep? And, and I'm like, um, yes, I do. But I'm so blessed that I do like power, power naps. And once I can, I can just knock off like about 30 minutes and it was like I really um, slept very well. But the thing is that I cannot be idle, but that is me because I'll fall ill if I am idle. And, um, you know, so we, we, we are just multitaskers, it's taskers. We, we, it's the woman that is the mother carrying the child and be still working through her, her, her you know, you know, through um, the pregnancy, gives birth, um, is the homemaker, still holds on a job, still is the is the cleaner, is the, you know, is the cook. You know, women are just born multitaskers and we can manage everything. We manage the home, you know, 
much more of the workforce is like when we go to work, it's like it's a, you know, we have like a respite kind of, you know, just going there to play because we know that the home sometimes can be quite more chaotic than the work, the, the work run. So, yes, um, I think women make better um, entrepreneurs, better managers. And um, I think, you know, the, the world is getting to know that and they're embracing that. And that's why, you know, we're seeing more women being directors and, you know, being head of departments and, 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 and the likes, yeah. Okay, uh, you like to... Uh... Yeah, um, no, I don't have any evidence to back any of what I'm going to say up at all. So it's just purely my opinion. Um, but um, I agree with multitasking. That is one of our biggest um, uh, attributes as a collective, really. We're, we're very good at multitasking. So I think that certainly helps. I wonder also if empathy is um, another characteristic I don't know I wonder whether um, non-male um, entrepreneurs maybe have slightly more empathetic traits I don't know I don't know it would be useful to investigate um, reflection I think we have a huge capacity to be reflective and less impulsive with our decision making um, and we work hard. <laughs> now, that I'm, I mean, I must say, though, that there are still some fantastic male um, entrepreneurs out there. So, um, but I do, I do wonder whether those things that I've listed, um, so adding to Gina's list, so empathy, reflection, less impulsive, and um, just the ca huge capacity to work hard uh, are maybe some of the reasons why we make good entrepreneurs. Okay, thanks for sharing that. I think the, uh, the points are quite valuable and they are also supported in the literature, you know, for us that are in academia. And I want to link that aspect to this leadership concept uh, because you've both mentioned it. Uh, there's this stereotypical behavior that women are living, just like you said earlier, about emotional gender, um, which, may be, which may impact on our leadership roles. And it's often said that women are maybe unfit in for leadership because of the emotional, maybe rationality. Again, I want to, you know, put it across to you. Do you agree, you know, being emotional in a woman, does that, should that be an impairment to our role as leaders? Can I just um, start with that? So I think um, emotion is actually an asset. Um, now I'm not suggesting that, you know, I think it's often taken out of context. You know, when people use the word emotion, they think that people are gonna be crying all over the place and sort of, sort of breaking down in floods of emotion and hysteria. I think emotional intelligence, the concept of emotional intelligence um, is well documented as being quite vital for leaders, leadership and being a good leader. And so if so having been able to tap into one's emotion, um, I think can only strengthen your ability to more to be more um, emotionally intelligent really. If it's used in a in a what's the word? If it's well managed, um, and it's used strategically in a, in a, in a you know, in, in a well sort of controlled way, I think it's probably an asset actually, um, is my view. Okay, well, I would like to believe that as well. Let's, uh, maybe Gina, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, I, I think um, I agree totally with um, Yinka on this. Um, you know, that obviously there are different stage it's um you know different ways that you can um define um emotions um emo emotional stress emotional intelligence degradation um you know uh, you know there's quite a, a lot of it and um i i would say that we and you know it depends on you know what you are actually um labeling you know the women to be we i would say that Emotional intelligence definitely um, 
you know, the tips of that into action, you know, we're able to actually, you know, um, you know, just drive and get things done into action, we increase, which increases our self-awareness, improves well-being, our relationships, the quality of life and effectiveness. And um, yeah, so I, I say that that is, that is more of an, um, an asset that, than um, a negative, really. Okay, thanks, thanks for, for sharing that thought. So we're doing very well and, and we're going to be uh, finishing soon, but I wanted to pick up on some of the point that were been mentioned before, uh, both of you, uh, Gina mentioned earlier about our passion uh, for contributing, empowering the next generation. And this is very evident even from her website as well. And I want to ask both of you, because you are very successful innovators, entrepreneurs in your startup and in organization. You know, what, and it's often said that obviously with Bain Women Innovators, uh, that the economy is benefiting from BAM step. STEM in the economy. There is a statistics uh, which was from Forward Ladies in 2018, uh, and it said uh, a boost of diversity through increased BAM women could bring 180 billion to the United Kingdom economy, especially due to the innovators BAM women work on. And they mentioned a few things. So for example, growth, mobility, and artificial intelligence. So Gina, Based on your own engineering and computer, you know, technical skills, what are you? What is your company doing to upskill, to empower? I know you've mentioned quite a few things, but primarily maybe in Africa, but in the UK, I believe your company is also UK based. What is your company doing to empower the next generation uh, into uh, this uh, tablets and your products that you're doing? You are muted, please. Sorry. At the moment, we set up a scheme where we go into like schools. I say like catch them at young. So we go into um, schools and we kind of like um, empower the, the kids. We just have like a round table session. Um, we started off with my, my, my daughter's school. I just have like a round table session when I go to visit and, um, you know, have all the kids there and, you know, they're very excited, very, very excited. Um, this year they set up um, um, an engineering um, aer aeronautics um, um, scheme for the for, for the for the for the students where during the holidays they went back to the way in school for like a week before they resumed and um they were able to actually work with aeronautic engineers to build like um you know um uh, a a test um, plane. So, you know, so the, our, our, our company is actually heavily involved in that and we're going to move that forward as we, as, as the year runs through because we, we've seen a lot of work that we have done in Africa and how that has really benefited um, some of the universities because like it's also um, that reorientation. Um, we call it like, um, you know, um, re-engineering um, some of the ways that kids are being taught um, is that is not how it's actually going to be used um, in the workforce. Um, so really letting them understand that. I know that everybody's like going into like, oh, get people and let them start coding. But when you do code um, and you do not follow um, particular steps, um, what you're going to have is that you're going to have um, a software that is really ridden with um, with um, with issues, right? And this is where the hacker actually, you know, gets into it, and they they pay attention to all of those loopholes that have been left. So once that we, you know, software is just not about writing the code. There's a lot that goes on before you actually get to the code. In fact, I always tell my students or people that um, um, students that we mentor. The code is the last thing to do. I can get anybody to write the code, but not everybody can to come up with a, a good design. Not everybody can write a good requirement. Not everybody can write um, 
um, de design a good algorithm. Um, and so by the time you get to that stage, by the time you get to the code, then you really understand exactly what you're doing. You understand what areas that you need to concentrate on. And so those are the things that we are also trying to like educate um, the next generation. You know, just don't be too anxious to start writing a code, understand exactly what you're writing um, before you get to that point. Um, AI is one of the things that we are um, very passionate about in the company. We've done um, some products for some um, mobile te um, operators where they, and this is in Africa, which is being rolled out. In fact, they're using that as we speak. Um, and it's based on AI technology, where it's like more of like security being able to. So nobody can, if you register yourself as um, Dr. Shala on a, your SIM card, you, you, you can't find um, maybe Gina being the person that is using that SIM card. So that is goes on in the background when they are actually um, do the registration. And so the back end is actually checking that this is actually what we're using AI to actually do that. Um, in our telemed way, telemedicine, there's the AI that we use as well that is integrated into that for diagnostics. I wish that um, the NHS, um, perhaps I can have a talk with Yinka later on, <laughs> which the NHS will just use this. I mean, we're not even asking you to pay anything, just use the platform. It's, it will be, um, you know, it, it's for what it's actually been created for, for us to be able to use the platform to um, help where we're at at the moment. And um, yeah, so we, we're, we're, we, we, you know, we've got continuous development. We, are, we continue to actually bridge the, um, the gaps in technology and, you know, by so doing also involving, um, you know, the young generation and to let them know exactly the proper way of it being done. So I hope I answered your question. Yes, yes, you did. Uh, Yika, if you just give me a uh, kind of quick reflection, and then I will open it, you know, to the audience to ask some questions. Sorry, the question was, what is the organization doing? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. in your case, um, you know, how have you been able to empower, you know, for example, your skill that you have built up over the years? You know, what are you doing to uh, empower maybe the next generation mentoring, for example? Yeah. I mean, me personally, um, I do... Uh, I don't do, it's not official mentoring, but I do unofficially mentor quite a few people, um, particularly women of color actually. So, um, and I'm also part of a group which is called the Shuri Network, um, S-H-U-R-I, uh, which is very much focused on women of color in tech. So uh, if any of you out there who <laughs> would find that interesting to become a member of, I would, I, I can send through the link later. Um, but aside from that, our organization is trying to do more. So NHSX is trying to do more around, diver I mean, in fact, diversity since last year's events has been very high on the agenda of NHSX. And we have steering groups and working groups and all sorts of groups that are actually driving forwards initiatives. Um, and one of the things we've done is to make sure that we are making sure that we're bringing in more talent from diverse backgrounds. Uh, so making sure our recruitment panels um, are reflective, uh, that there's no bias, all of that sort of thing. And then part of my, my portfolio in as a director of work, digital workforce, mm -hmm. is to figure out how are we going to bring more diverse talent across the whole of the NHS sector in the tech space. Um, so any strategy or initiatives that I, we roll out will need to have diversity and inclusion very much embedded within that. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, so we now have opportunity for questions from the audience. Uh, Lindsay, I'm not sure whether, are there any questions for chats? Hi, so um, yes, uh, Simonetta has a question. So, uh, and I believe she wanted to ask it uh, herself to the panel. So I invite Simonetta. Oh, I just want to put the camera on. 
<laughs> no, okay. I don't want to waste uh, time. First of all, thank you so much, which has been incredibly inspiring conversation. Um, my question is, based on your, to both of you, based on your experience, really, if you were in a position to, uh, what would you be in your message, as I put in the chat, to the policymakers? What would you say, this is what you really need to do? What kind of pragmatic intervention do you think also could be taken? What kind of good practice you have come across that perhaps it could be shared much more widely? So there are three questions in one, I'm sorry. <laughs> So Simonetta, can you repeat the first question, please? Can you? Yeah, the first, the first is one, what would you say to policymakers? Um, what would you be your message to policymakers that they should do at this junction to increase women representation in the innovation ecosystem, entrepreneurship? Uh, what kind of pragmatic intervention do you think should be adopted? And what kind of good practice you have come across already that you think ah, actually this could be could be shared more widely. And if I can just add, I made quite a lot of notes on your talk. And one of the things that I found really interesting that you mentioned, and I it came it, it emerged also from another panel discussion on similar top a similar topic, the question of failure. Should we actually reframe failure? Um, maybe not even call it failure. It's not failure, is it? Uh, no. We had another panelist on, on a different event who said she cited Edison that when it was put to him that he failed. He said, no, I haven't failed. I just proved um, ways that don't work. So that is also very interesting. How do we, how do we start a conversation on that? So, sorry, I added another question, but ju just answer what you what you what you want of um, of those. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's start with the first question, which is uh, the uh, what message would you pass on to policymakers? Yeah, tell them what to do. Yeah. Okay, mm. we will answer that. Um, Can I start with? Is I that Gina? Also, yes, yeah. that's fine. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Quite a, a lot of questions are very, very relevant. Um, I would say we all know that to be, to um, you know, the inclusion, especially when it comes to, um, to, to women in technology. Um, but I always say that um, not only just including women, but also empowering the women, um, because like right from, um, um, university or even like when doing um, A levels, they're being sidelined once you know that they are going into the technology phase. So that needs to be drummed into from the from you know from from schools. They need to empower girls, um, you know, going into you know tech. Make those um, uh, make make the resources available for them to be able to thrive in. Because like some, um, I remember at my time, there was um, BTEC National. I don't know if they still have BTEC now. I mean, I did A-levels, but if um, I had like someone that, were meant, that had mentored me very well, I probably would have done BTEC actually. Because in my first year of university, I struggled a little bit because especially when it came to like, the theory was no problem for me. But when it came to the practicals, I struggled a bit because like most of the people that were there, either their father had like mechanics and um, they had like workshops or their father was like um, an electronics engineer. So they had like a garage that they were, you know, designing like um, oil pumps, you know, like um, power, power supplies and all of that stuff, you know. So when it came to the theory, I sailed, obviously, but when it came to the practicals, I struggled. So all of those things should, needs to be introduced at the, at the early stage of um, edu education. And um, I think for me, that's, that, that will be some of the things that I will drive into the policymaker and make funding really available. We, you know, we, we sh they should not um, favor um, one gender over the other, you know, we should give everybody a chance, including the women, 
you know, I don't believe, so totally believe, uh, the reason why we're talking about faith, um, you know, women empowerment is because, the, you know, there's been, you know, it's it's not been balanced, you know, they favour the, the men more than the women. We should not even get to that stage, you know, you should go for the best, you know, you should give everybody a fair try. And that's what would have, I would drive, um, you know, that would be my message to the policymakers. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Nyinka, because you are yeah. in the chase, can you yeah. give very briefly? Yeah, a very brief response. So um, from a healthcare perspective, um, policymakers know already and uh, are thinking quite hard about diversity in general. Um, some pragmatic quick wins that have already started, but we'll be developing over the next two to three years is around apprenticeships. So getting in early, we need, we need, so we want to build a pipeline, a much more sustainable pipeline of talent. And that you need to do from very early on before they're even thinking about what career to go into. Um, so apprenticeships, and there's a, there's a national apprenticeships levy, which is currently underused. So, um, so I think one of the things that I will be doing is to try and see how we can maximize the usage of the existing apprenticeships levy and uh, using that to encourage more girls uh, and young women into exploring uh, technical careers. Thank you very much. I hope that answered your question, uh, Simonita. And then the last one, which is about reflection on should we reframe failure you know what was what's your response to that interview quickly yes yes we should uh but that's a cultural deep cultural um problem that we need to solve uh so it's not going to be something that we can do overnight but yes i, I definitely think that um we do need to reframe failure because actually failure is good um, it depends on which sector you're in, though, I have to say. So if you're in a mission critical, um, safe, safety um, driven sector like healthcare, failure to, to reframe failure will take a little bit more time uh, than if you're in another sector like, I don't know, um, retail or, or something like that. Um, uh, but yes, I think as a whole, we, we do need to work harder to reframe it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, because of time, I'm not sure whether we have time to take uh, any more questions. Lindsay, is there any, any question from the audience? Um, don't have any more in the uh, in the chat itself, um, but I'm sure we all sort of have questions and want to hear a lot more because those have been such fascinating talks. If I can be a little bit greedy and ask a very quick one, um, I'm, I was quite inspired about the way that you're talking about empowering um, other women and bringing them into the spaces, and I wondered how that sits along with the notion of, of competition. Uh, because it sounds like that has been a part of your professional lives and in some ways can be really um, energizing. So do you think that there is a tension between competition and, you know, helping other people to succeed? Um, I'll go first if you want. Thank um, you. Yes, I am I, I absolutely real spot on. And um, there is, um, but... Um, there is a fine line between but that um, competition and you know the drive to succeed, um, and there shouldn't really be really. Um, but the thing is that we've been made, you know, like even through like um, the the your pay, what your your salary, um, you see that you know you you have people that come in that you train, and they still get paid more than you. Um, so you feel that you need to work twice as hard to really be um, visible, really, and that should not be at all. But unfortunately, that's basically that. That's how it is. But when you now come out of that, for me, when I come out of that, and um, in the workforce, obviously that is there. But as an entrepreneur, I don't feel that I need to compete with anyone. I don't think that I need to compete with anyone because I know for, you know, I've 
earlier on, even when I was, um, when, when I'm in the work, either I'm consulting or I am, um, you know, uh, you know, a, a staff in a corporation, um, I always knew that the other side had the problem, not me. And that's because even my colleagues, when they validate you and, you know, they're only like, oh, we've got a good pay rise, you know, you know, you know what do you must have gotten, you know, so much. And then you now turn around and it's like, actually, you know, you have been paid much less than them. And then you go and you speak to your manager and, um, you know, they, they say that it's not even meant to be discussed, really. That that's just how it is. So so you 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 learn a lot of all the secrets as you go along in the workforce. But then, not that you accept it, because you try to actually challenge it. But then you have to be careful because when you talk about it, you're being looked at as being a troublemaker. So how yes, do you uh, tackle? <laughs> I'm mindful of time now. I wish we have more time. So how do you, yeah? So so how do you tackle that? So really, in the workforce, it is there. It's prevalent there. Um, but when you come out of that, you know how good you are and how you're able to give results. And um, so it's not a problem. Thank you very much, uh, Gina, for that uh, comment and remark. I think I'm going to probably uh, bring the conversation to a close. But I think my closing question will be, you know, what has been your most satisfying moment? Of being an innovator, and please just probably one word. What would be? What will you describe as your most satisfying moment, Nika? I'll just say defining the future. Okay, that's good. Gina, um, I would say um, defining the future and um, obviously empowering um, the the next generation. Thank you very, very much indeed. Uh, so I think we have, I hope that we have taken some very valuable insights, knowledge, experiences, and lessons from the multitude of what Gina and Nika has shared with us about their experience as women, innovator, and entrepreneur, both startup and mature business, and also in the public health. And uh, if anybody is here that you are thinking about going into business, uh, at least you, you have heard from you know, women, you know, black women, that it is possible, it is doable, even though there are challenges, but do not give up. Uh, I want to give maybe one minute to Simonita to just kind of close us uh, very, very quickly. Uh, just few of Professor Simonita Mafredi, uh, she's the chair of the Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Research Network. Monita. Thank you, Shola. I just say this has been such an inspiring conversation. And I think there are some themes here, like the re rethinking, reflect, reflecting on, on failure, for example, cultural issues that perhaps we ought to continue this conversation. Um, I think what is, I find is very interesting by talking to women in this space, and women like yourself who are very openly and honestly, and thank you for sharing your experiences, not only we have learning enough and how perhaps we can, uh, uh, you know, what we can be done about um, improving diversity, building on your, on your lived experiences. But at the same time, I think we can start to change things. Uh, you talk about the, the, the defining the future, change the culture, but change the culture for everybody, rethinking about some of these processes. What uh, you know, that it was fascinating the, the question that Lindsay asked about competition. Um, so, starting to think in different ways rather than the male type of uh, approach of being very competitive and uh, being driven by uh, certain, certain uh, values other than others. So, I think it is like with everything when you, when you, diversity is also a way of rethinking a great way of rethinking how we do things. Um, and I'll uh, just leave it at that base. Thank you so much for both of you for your being generous with your time and talking to us. Um, Shola, thank you for 
uh, sharing it so beautifully, the panel, and thanks, Lindsay, as well. Uh, and I think what we would like to do is probably, I believe I've been recorded the event, has it? Yes, yeah, it does. So, so I'll be recording them, maybe share it more widely so other people will be able to, um, to listen to this fascinating uh, panel. So thank you very much to everybody. And indeed to all the other colleagues in, uh, who have been uh, making this event possible and uh, will be helping in uh, um, disseminating it further.